Let's just spend a moment of silence in God's presence. Many of us have had long, probably interesting journeys today. We may not be fully settled in to our accommodation, a number of things on our minds, but I really believe God wants to speak to us on the opening evening of this convention. So just take a moment to ask God to deal with any concerns you have, any worries you have, and ask him to just put those to rest in your mind so that we can hear the word of God. Lord, we thank you for our brother Steve. Thank you for the way you've used his ministry in my life. And Lord, I want to hear your voice again through Steve this evening. And I'm sure, Lord, I'm speaking on behalf of many of my brothers and sisters in this tent. We're longing to hear from you. And we believe you're going to take Steve as your servant in our lives this evening by your spirit. Speak through him, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Steve Brady has had many years in uh, local church ministry. He's now the principal of Moorlands Bible College and a council member of the Keswick Convention, and we're delighted that he's our opening speaker at this convention. Thank you, Steve. I'd like you to return with me, please, this evening to that passage that Elaine uh, read so well for us from the uh, New Living Translation of Psalm 8. Psalm 8. I wonder what kind of year you're having. Maybe you've come to Keswick this year and it's been going swimmingly well. You got your, your degree out the way. Things have been going well. Maybe in, you've just got married. Uh, you've just celebrated your, the first the arrival of a, a grandchild or your own child. Maybe you've just had a promotion. Maybe your career's taking off. Maybe somebody's just left you a legacy or even a fortune. If so, do please see me afterwards. We've got a three million pound building project on at Morelands. Or maybe you feel a little like uh, someone I was speaking to a little while ago who described his experience like this. He said, I feel that I'm crossing Niagara Falls on a gossamer thin piece of wire. And I feel I am pushing a wheelbarrow that is filled with explosives to which I am handcuffed and that a timing device is set to go off I know not when. And from both sides of the divide, people are firing submachine guns at me. <laughs> and if that were not bad enough, as I look to the skies, I notice that a hurricane is beginning to rip on in. I wonder whether that's been your experience of turbulence these last few months. Well, whatever our experience may have been, my desire tonight as we turn to this psalm is that we may find in it a prescription to help us to restore our vision of God. I want to call it how to restore your spiritual vision. Because the fact is in the hurly-burly of life, whether we're at the top and things are going really well and then we're tempted to forget the Lord, or we're really at the bottom and things are going really badly, we can also lose our vision of God. How is it with you and your vision of God? Do you remember the story of the man who went to his GP one day and he said, Oh, doctor, he said, I'm going out of my mind. You've got to help me. You've got to help me. The doctor said, Just calm down. What's your problem? He said, Well, I don't know how to explain it. He said, But when I go to bed at night and I put my head on the pillow, he said, I'm just drifting off when suddenly I hear this song. It's all about the green, green grass of home. Oh, said the doctor, That's significant. Oh, he said, no, it's only half of it, doctor. He said, to get some peace, I, I lie on the other side, and then it's all about a woman called, oh, he said, don't tell my wife, will you? It's all about a woman called Delilah, Delilah. Oh, said the doctor, calm down. He said, I know precisely what's wrong with you. He said, you do, doctor? He said, yes. He said, you've got Tom Jones syndrome. <laughs> he said, I've got what, doctor? He said, well, you know, Tom Jones, the great Welsh singer, they're two of his greatest hits. Didn't you know that? Delilah and the green, green grass of home. He said, you've got Tom Jones syndrome, my man. Calm down. Oh, he said, thank you, doctor. He said, doctor, is this a rare condition? And the doctor began to sing, no, it's not unusual. <laughs> Some of you are too young to understand that joke. <laughs> I 
But if you've lost your vision of God, it is not unusual. And this psalm wants to give us three pieces of, at least I'm going to suggest it gives us three pieces of equipment that were not open to the psalmist, but are open and available to us. It offers us a telescope, a microscope, and a pair of binoculars, or a set of binoculars. Telescopes, microscopes, and binoculars. Here's the first thing. How do I restore my spiritual vision here at Keswick this week? How am I going to meet with God so I go from this place different to what I came? One, look through your telescope. Look through your telescope. You notice how this psalm is bolted together. It starts, verse 1, with God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And it finishes, verse 9, with exactly the same refrain. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And right in the middle, it puts people. What is man? What are mere mortals that you consider them, that you turn your mind towards them? Here are the great bookends of this psalm and indeed of the whole story of the Bible. That at both extremities, there is God with people bounded then. We've got boundaries when God's there. When God isn't there, there are no boundaries for human existence. But when God's there, a beginning and end, there's boundaries and there's security and there's grace. And as the psalmist begins to think about God, he says, Oh God, your name is majestic in in all the earth. Our problems are so often, you see, that instead of God being at the beginning and the end and holding everything in between in His almighty hands, if we're not careful, we're at the beginning, we're at the end, and then we're in trouble. And this, this psalm is a call for a seismic shift in our perspective from being you're like a big word, anthropocentric, people-centered, man-centered, to being theocentric for putting God where He belongs. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. What kind of God is this? Will verses 3 and 4 quickly tell us? When I consider Your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place. I like to what the New Living Translation put it. When I consider the night sky, for that's what's in view here. It's the moon, you see, in the night sky, in a clear eastern sky. When I look at the vastness of, of the heavens, the sky at night. When I consider that, the sky at night, what, what is it? With all its vast teeming millions of stars, he says, they are the work of your fingers. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? Think about it. The work of your fingers. As somebody put it, they are the, the, the world and the universe is prodded into shape by the divine digits. See a little guy with his plasticine. Imagine my little grandson coming up three with his plasticine and he's prodding it into shape or at least doing something with it. It's better he's got his hands into plasticine than other things we won't go to now. And here's the picture of God. In his vastness and his greatness, he's prodding the whole universe, the sky and all that is in it. He's prodding it. He's playing it round with, just with his fingers, not even his hands. He's forging it and he's shaping it and he's controlling it. That's the image. That's the picture. The moon and the stars which you have made, of you've set in place. The moon, just a mere three quarters of a million miles away. The stars, Alpha Proxima or Alpha Centauri, millions and billions and billions of light years away. The stars. Our star, our sun, around which our nine planets go, is one of a hundred thousand million similar suns in our galaxy. And our galaxy is one of perhaps two billion or two trillion similar galaxies. It's a huge number. There are a billion, billion planets and stars and more in the hands of God. There is this vast cosmos. 
that the Hubble telescope can even, not even begin to imagine its splendor and its immensity. There's a big phrase for that theologically you may have heard me use before. It's, wow! <laughs> this vast world with all its billions of planets, this huge cosmos, this known universe, and all that's beyond it. And he says, it's just the work of your fingers. It's what you have set in place. And if God is that big, that even his fingers can prod away at it, if he's the grand designer of the grand design, then, then of course he's the creator. He's the sustainer of all that is. That's what's being asserted. Notice what it says in verse 7 and following. All flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and all that's in the paths of the sea. All created life, not just in the cosmos, but on little planet Earth. Animals, birds, reptiles, marine life, the big sea monsters, the smallest amoeba imaginable. He's saying, Lord, all this is made by you. On Christmas Island in the Pacific Ocean, a certain season in the year, 120 million, don't tell me, don't ask me how you count them, 120 million land crabs, which are indigenous to that island, are found nowhere else in the world. They make their way, the female land crabs, from their burrows where they've mated a month before, and they go down to the coral reef, and each of them disgorges up to 100 thousand eggs and those eggs then hatch in the sea and if only two out of a million of those eggs hatch and make it back to Christmas Island only two out of a million every five years then the indigenous population of the land crab of Christmas Island is maintained and it is. Why? Not even David Attenborough knows. <laughs> they are all, verse 6, the works, the works of your hands. And that's why verse 4 is then so poignant. In the light of this immense God the inexhaustible one, the great creator of the ends of the universe and the upholder of the smallest form of life. What is man? What is man in the light of that? What, is, what are people? What are mere mortals? And the answer is, verse 5, you made him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, maybe than God or, or the angels. From astronomy to the animal kingdom, from stars to sea creatures, from moons to mankind, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. That's the Christian doctrine of creation. That the world isn't just a a chance collection of atoms, that it wasn't just some blind chaos that has given birth to all that there is, and we live, therefore, in absurdity. We came from nothing, and we go to nothing. Now, this is the picture of a creator God whose name is, verse 1, the Lord, the great I am, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, the God who not only makes all things and sustains all things, but makes himself known, who is a revelation, uh, who's a, a revelational God, who speaks, who has taken for himself in the flow of the Bible story here, who's taken for himself a people, that ancient people Israel, who spoke to them, who's given them to them his laws, who's made known his being and his ways. And the response is, or should be, verse 1, how majestic is your name in all the earth, or thou whose glory is chanted above the heavens, says another translation. Thou whose glory is chanted above the heavens. The reaction should be that even in the heavens, the, 
the holiest place of all, the very uh, glorious beings, the cherubim and seraphim like Isaiah 6, they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the psalmist says, we join our praises to that on earth so that even out of the mouths of children and infants you've ordained praise. My grandson lives with us. Or peaceful hours I once enjoyed, how sweet their memory still. <laughs> Our two and a half year old mobile demolition squad goes around singing all sorts of things. And he comes in and says, Daddy, G Granddaddy, Jesus song, Jesus loves me, this I know. And singing the praises of God. It's awe inspiring, isn't it? Wonderful. This little character out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, out of the mouths of mere infants from the cradle. Lord, you've ordained praise. You've, you've made people, even from their, their youngest, most vulnerable, and most immature state, you have made us to give you praise and honor and glory. You've made us to be worshipers, to bring adoration and praise to you. Why is man? Why is man? Why are people? Why are we here? What's it all about? What is man's chief end, asks the old Westminster Shorter Catechism. And the answer comes back, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Just this last uh, year, this last month or so, one of our, our uh, graduates is uh, just leaving us from Orleans. He was, a few years ago, he was a young rabbinical student in Jerusalem when he became a Christian. When it comes to Hebrew, as we used to say of other languages, and uh, when I was a pastor in East London, he speaks it like a native. <laughs> so because of that, when he came to third year Hebrew, he decided he would dodge third year Hebrew because he didn't want to teach the teacher anymore. <laughs> and he'd sit in my third year Greek option, and we'd drink lots of coffee, and we'd turn over the fine nuances of the the Greek New Testament. We're well, halfway through our, this informal gathering, a lecture seminar with eight or ten people one morning when he just suddenly says, ah, Steve, that reminds me of the, the, the rabbinical concept of, of nensof. Well, of course, it was the very word on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> so I, I, I suggested that for the benefit of the class, he might like to extrapolate further on the rabbinical concept of Nensof. Yes, he said, uh, it's very Jewish still. He said, Nensof, know before whom you stand. Know before whom you stand. That's Nensof. It's knowing your place in the universe. It's knowing your place in the great scheme of things. It's knowing that God has made you and this immense, glorious, inexhaustible, uncreated creator is the one before whom you stand. So it may birth reverence and awe and vision and perspective into our often over-hurried lives. Look through your telescope. You lost that vision of God in His immensity and greatness. But then, secondly, we're invited to peer down our microscopes. This vast, inexhaustible Creator God for whom the whole universe is merely the work of His fingers. In the light of that, the question is asked, what is man that you are mindful of Him? At first, of course, the emphasis here is on what seems to be our insignificance. In comparison to all that there is out there, we're just a tiny little speck of interstellar dust called our earth. And we sitting here tonight are just one or two or a few thousand of six billion people on planet earth. Remember a piece I came across many years ago in David Watson, What is Man? Is he more than a chance collection of atoms? And there's that lovely little phrase. As to his ingredients, man, I'm sorry, it's people really today, is nothing but fat enough for seven bars of soap. 
iron enough for one medium-sized nail, sugar enough to fill seven cups of tea, lime enough to whitewash one chicken coop, phosphorus enough to dip 2,200 matches, magnesium enough for one dose of salts, potash enough to explode one toy crane, and sulfur enough to rid one dog of fleas. The 1965 Nobel laureate uh, Jacques Monod said, to man qua man, by man which meaning man, to man qua man, we may gladly say good riddance. See, we're living in a world where what it means to be human from every side is being attacked. As we plot the, the human genome, as we try and work out the sheer complexity and yet the seeming potential simplicity of what people are. Is there a difference between people and computers? Are we just highly evolved species, but actually we just came from some primeval slime, and from nothing we came, and to nothing we shall return? It's possible to be reductionist with people. And that's why there's such a challenge in the whole ethical area, isn't there, about what is life? What's the status of a of an embryo. And at, if that's a challenge at life's genesis, at life's exodus, why not get rid of granny because she's becoming a burden upon us all? At, uh, pool, a mater at, at the maternity wing in Poole Hospital near where I live, there's a notice up in the maternity wing which says, the first warning, the first five minutes of life can be very critical. Somebody wrote underneath, the fi last five minutes can be a bit dodgy as well. <laughs> We're living in a world of reductionism. And yet these verses tell us something that actually flies in the face of that. It's possible to read the Bible in such a way of worm theology. And there's a strand of that that were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, as I'll show in a moment. But the emphasis here is not firstly upon our undoubted perversity and our undoubted depravity. The emphasis here is upon our amazing dignity. Look what it says. What is man? You made him a little lower than their heavenly beings, and you crowned him with glory and honor. The word glory there is a lovely Hebrew word. It means kabod. It means weight, substance. You gave, he says, to us something that is in you. You are the only real being in the universe, and you have bequeathed to humanity, to people, kabod, weight, substance, reality. So that every person matters. What's being echoed here, of course, we're right back to the dawn of times of Genesis 1 and 2, to our theme for tonight. This is a reminder that people, whoever they are, are made in the image and likeness of God, created for His pleasure and His glory. What is man? You made him. You made him just a little lower than the heavenly beings, a little lower than the angels. The word itself in the Hebrew is God. Perhaps that's what's meant here. Despite our perversity, we were made to be godlike in our being and in our ways, to mimic our Creator, not as little gods, but to be those godlike qualities. We can't be eternal like God without beginning and end. But there are things about us that can be like God what the theologians like to call the communicable attributes of God, His wisdom, His grace, His power, His love, His compassion, His mercy. And that's why it talks about, Lord, you made Him the ruler over the works of your hands. When God created mankind on the face of the earth, He gave them dominion over His world, not to exploit it in cruelty, but to manage it and to harvest it. 
would take us too far from our subject here to debate the rights of or wrongs of animal rights and wrongs. My good friend Tony Sargent, two or three years ago, brought an excellent little book out, a starter for 10 on it, Animal Rights and Wrongs. Recommend it to you. But what's in view here is the dominion of people, that there is a qualitative difference between people and all the rest of God's created order. It's not that animals or birds or fishes are not created by God, but they are not created with the dignity, the worth, the kaboth, the reality, the substance, the weight of human beings. That's why you remember when there was that Gadarene demoniac and all the demons went into the pigs and 2,000 pigs rushed on down into the Galilee. And there was pandemonium from folk. They'd lost their living. But as far as Jesus is concerned, and hear me carefully on this, the life of one person far outweighs the life even of 2,000 swine. Because in the hierarchy and pecking order of things, there is a qualitative difference between people and the rest of the created sphere. It's not saying that they're, they're there to be exploited or to be cruel to, but there is an order. Remember that old cartoon with the uh, chimpanzee looking out on his keeper, and there's a little thought blob above his head, Am I my keeper's brother? <laughs> well, the answer to the Bible is no. That we are made in the image of God. We are the ones who can address God. O oh Lord, notice, our Lord. You have set your glory. You have done this. This is conversation with the Almighty. We had a dog, Bruno the boxer. No, I mean, Harry, that's why he was called Bruno. We had a cat called Tyson. They used to go 15 rounds regularly, and Bruno always used to win. Oh, Bruno was a great character. Sometimes young families would come. They couldn't remember coming to the Brady household, but they remembered Bruno. There should have been a text by their dogs. You shall know them. He was a great character, but you know, our Bruno, he never, he would have come with us, but he never have entered into a period of worship in church. They'd have never have wanted to sing here at Keswick because he wasn't made for that purpose and with that objective in mind. But you and I were. We are made to be worshipers, made for a love relationship with our Creator God. And that almighty Creator, He invests His people, He invests every person with worth and dignity. They're made in His image. People matter to God. That's why verse 4 says, you, verse 5, you made him a little lower than the angels. I'm sorry, verse 4, what, what is man that you are mindful of him? He is mindful of us, that you care for him. He cares for us, casting all your care upon him, says Peter eventually, 1 Peter 5, 7. For he cares for you, this eternal, splendid, glorious God who holds the whole universe in his hands. He cares for people, not just as a job lot, but personally. So Jesus could say, even the hairs on your head are numbered. It's easier for some of us than others, isn't it, Pete? But we won't go there either. Of course, if I was to stop with this picture of the, the glory of people, their dignity, their call to harvest the earth and to be co-workers with God, then I'd only, of course, be telling you half the story. In this very chapter, in this very psalm, verse 2 tells us of another story. It talks about your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. In my Bible, just likewise, on the same page the, of my Bible, it will talk in, uh, in verse 14 of chapter 7 about he who is pregnant with evil or Psalm 9, verse 5, you've rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. So we don't distort the picture because, of course, Genesis 1 and 2 is not the end of the story of people in their godlike qualities because it's followed by that cataclysmic turning point of the whole story of the Bible, Genesis 3, and the rebellion and the falling from grace, and the being driven out of the garden of God. 
the great fall of mankind. So a biblical picture of people is this, that at one level we are fantastic, but we're flawed. At another level we are fabulous, but we're fallen. We are noble, but we're ruins. That's the biblical basis. That's what the Bible teaches. That all is not well. That there are enemies and foes and avengers. So this dignity of mankind that's emphasized in this psalm is juxtaposed with the depravity of people too. Just this week we've witnessed both those extremes in an amazing court case, haven't we? I use it for illustration. I suppose there, but for the grace of God, go any of us. A man with immense ability, dignity, fantastic storyteller, the third best-selling author in the world, worth about 35 million pounds, moving in the echelons of power, a heartbeat away from what was happening in government a decade ago. What dignity, what creativity. And a liar and a womanizer and a man who's betrayed his nearest and his dearest. What perversity, what depravity. It's the story of every one of us, isn't it? When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. It's a contradiction of being a human person. It's the paradox, it's the mystery, it's the tension that we live in a world where we can reach for the stars and become more debased than the animals in the jungle or the, the very slugs in the slime. The Bible talks about us as deceiving and being deceived. On New Year's Eve, I heard this in Ireland, so you'll have to forgive me for where it came from. On New Year's Eve in Dublin, a taxi driver picked up a fare. It was a nun. And he kept looking in the mirror, and the nun said, Is everything all right, son? And the, the taxi driver said, Well, it isn't, it isn't, mother, you know. She says, What ails you on this New Year's Eve? Oh, he said, You know, mother, there's things that... A man at the end of his life would like to say he's done. Oh, says the nun, like what? Well, he said, Mother, to be blunt with you, I'd like to say I've kissed the nun. <laughs> oh, she said, son. Oh, she said, well, for that to happen, there'd be two conditions. One, you'd have to be a good Catholic, and two, you'd have to be single. Oh, Mother, he said, this must all go well for the new year. He said, I've always been a loyal son of the church, and I'd never leave the leading lady in me life, me one and only mammy. Pull over, she says. He pulls over. Come round, come round. She says, peck me on the cheek. and gives a little peck on the cheek. Gets back in the car. Starts driving again. She says, there we are, son. You can die a happy man. He cow, oh, mother. He said, I can't, I can't. I've got things to confess to you. Oh, she says, I'm a nun, not a priest. No, no, mother. No, he said, it's specific. I've got two things to confess to you. One, I've got a wife and five kids. And two, I'm not Catholic. I'm a Protestant. <laughs> Oh, she says, you should be ashamed of yourself on this New Year's Eve. Mind you, she says, I have two things to confess to you. One, I'm not a nun, and two, my name is Kevin on the way to a fancy dress ball. The difficulty of the human situation. <laughs> Made a little lower than the angels. Crowned with glory and honor. And often mooching round amidst the scraps of life. So is that the end of the story then? Not quite. You see, this psalm, like the whole of the Old Testament, is stretching forward for something for something more, for someone more. The whole storyline of the Old Testament, to give it a posh word, is, is, is eschatological. It's prophetic. It's reaching, straining forward. 
Genesis 1 and 2, men and women made in the image of God. Genesis 3, lost and ruined, sick and sore through the fall. Is that the end of the story? And then the note of hope in Genesis 3.15, God's programmatic statement for the human race. That the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. And from that, the rest of the Bible story begins to unfold. That God himself is going to do something about this contradiction, this paradox called the human condition in our depravity and our dignity. And that leads us to say that not only do we need telescopes to look through them and uh, microscopes to peer down, but we need to focus our binoculars as we come to towards the end of this psalm. You ever look through binoculars? I'm sure you have at some point. Have you ever tried to look through binoculars just firstly through one eye? <laughs> bit difficult. And then you shut the other eye and you have a look through the other one. And then hopefully you, you put both eyes together and you can synthesize a, a picture before you, a scene. That's what we're invited to do with this psalm. We can look at it through one eye of the binocular, as it were. We can look through one, shut the other one, and what we see is humanity being celebrated. But, but I want to give you a slightly different translation. It's, uh, it goes like this. It's just very simple. See if you notice it in verse 5. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And you will crown him with glory and honor. You will make him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Did you notice the subtle change? You will crown him with glory and honor. You will make him ruler over the works of your hands. There's a little nuance in the original Hebrew. And I checked it out with my rabbinic friend just to make sure. It goes from the past and then it, in the middle... It's called a chiastic uh, phrase for those of you who are into that sort of thing. It tops and tails. It says the past and the past. And then in the middle, there are these two future tenses. Something that God will do. This psalm reminds us prophetically. Not of a human ideal, which is not earth in reality. But it reminds us of a coming reality, a prophecy. A promise from God that he's going to do something about it. Now, at this point, and to keep us alert, I'd like you to turn over in your Bibles. Uh, if you don't know where it is, just sit there looking spiritual. But over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Major cross-reference. Where these verses are quoted, some of them. Hebrews chapter 2. And the, the writer says in verse 6, there is a place where someone has testified. Then he quotes this psalm. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under his feet, God let nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, to people, to mankind, to you and me. But... We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, in bringing many sons, and here's the word, to glory. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation, the file leader, the one who goes before, perfect, through suffering. Every one of us here tonight have been made in the image of God. That's what gives us worth. And every one of us here tonight, that image has been defaced and marred and spoilt. When I was 19, one of my close friends I'd had the joy of seeing come to Christ was involved in an order, uh, a motor accident on the M6 near Litchfield. I went down to see him. He was in intensive care. They allowed me to go in, and I went in to see my pal, Tommy Taylor, just 19 like me. 
It was just a couple of folk in the, the uh, ITU unit. I looked around and I, I couldn't see him, so I came out and I said to the nurse, I'm sorry, he's not in there. And she said, oh, yes, he is. And she came back in with me. And she said, he is your friend. I could scarce believe it. Even now, as I close my eyes, I can see this, this massive head, swollen, bruises, and it wasn't my, it was, but it wasn't. He was the image, the visage of my friend, and it was all messed up. It was all blown out of proportion. He looked ghastly. He looked deadly. He was dying. He never recovered. Here's the face of my friend whom I loved, marred by an accident, smashed up, young life. God sees in every one of you when every one of you and me here this evening, God sees His image, His face, smashed up, not just by the accidents of life, but often deliberately in rebellion. He sees that across the whole face of humanity tonight. And He says, these were my children whom I made for my glory. Then the great storyline of the Bible kicks in in earnest. For the great and incredible storyline is that there is one who is the perfect image of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 speaks of Jesus, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the true image, the ultimate image, the eternal image, the second person of the Trinity, the everlasting Son of God. What I wouldn't have given to see my friend's face, his image restored. If I only could have given him, like some spin doctor, a makeover. But imagine somebody said to me, the cost of that will be, I had a kid brother 12 years my junior, just seven years of age, living at home. What say we take your kid brother and we put him in the place of your friend. And we substitute his life, your brother's life, for this friend's life. What do you think about that for a deal? Oh, I don't think I could contemplate that. What say that one looking so messed up? has killed my parents, has defied my, my heart, has, has messed up my life, has consistently lied about me. Would I do it then? An enemy? Never mind a friend? I ha now, thank God, have a son at home. I wouldn't give my son for my best friend. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the true image of the infinite, came to suffer and die on this little speck of interstellar dust. For little humanly compared to the divine, little tiny termites. Surely we're not worth the price and the cost, are we? Yet this is the story of the Bible, that the Word became flesh and lived amongst us and went to a cross. He died that we might be forgiven, and He died to make us good. So that we wouldn't only be forgiven... But that image that is marred and lost and ruined and defaced and defiled, the image of God in people might be restored. Restored for all eternity. That's why Hebrews 2.10 says, in bringing many sons to glory, 
What does sin do to you? Well, it messes up your life and it robs you of the glory of God. All have sinned, Romans 3.23, and come short of what? The glory of God. The glory of God. And what's this great invasion of planet Earth in a, a, a virgin's womb? And in a little tiny village called Bethlehem, what's this invasion of planet Earth all about? That he might bring many sons to glory. While wounds that mar the chosen one, writes Stuart Townend, may bring many sons to glory. To glory. And if you are a child of God, then a great transformation process has begun in you to remake you and remodel you and reshape you and reform you and transform you into the glory of God again so that you are not only forgiven, but you are made an heir and a joint heir with Christ. So one day he's going to share all his inheritance, which is the known universe and everything beyond it, with his redeemed. That's not only your dignity. My friend, that's your destiny. Robert Louis Stevenson, I'm not sure of where he stood on a number of things, but he said some wonderful words. The stars shine over the mountains. The stars shine over the sea. The stars look up to the mighty God. And the stars look down on me. The stars will shine for a million years, a million years in a day. But God and I will live and love when the stars have passed away. Wow. From my depravity in Christ, my dignity is restored, and now I have a destiny. Do you know those words of Psalm 113? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. My friend, he seats us not only with angels and archangels, but even above them. For we shall judge even angels. Isn't that astonishing? Why can you believe that stuff? Because the Bible tells me so. You lost your way? Have you wandered from God? Have you never come to Christ to be forgiven? Never asked Christ to change you so that this image of God is restored in you? Have you been away from God tonight? You've wandered far. You've lost the plot. You've lost your vision of God. You don't know why you're here and where you're going. And this psalm is a call. It's a call to forsake your depravity and perversity. It's a call to come home to Christ, to follow Him and to be transformed by His powerful Spirit again into the image of God so that you are a bearer of his glory and a reflector of his splendor in the earth. Last century, there was a famous rescue mission run in New York called the Bowery Mission, and its famous superintendent was a man by the name of Sam Hadley. On one occasion, a young lad turned up. He was probably only 15 or 16 years of age. He, he was quite disheveled. His trousers were torn. He was dirty. He was in a right state. And he knocked at Sir Sam Hadley's door, and by the time they were getting through the, the third bowl of soup, the story began to unfold how this boy had left his home. I think it was in Philadelphia. He'd, uh, he grabbed some money out of his father's store, out of his till. He put it on a horse that it was just cert to win. He'd lost this money, and as a result, he couldn't face his father, so he'd run away. He'd run away to the big city. But he had no friends no family, and he was arrested for vagrancy, having slept overnight on a park bench by the New York police. He'd been in prison only for a short time, but he was disheveled, he was messed up, he was far from home. 
Sam Hadley kindly said to this young man, young man, go home. Go home to your father. He said, I can't go home, sir. I can't go home. I've messed it up so much. He, he'll never forgive me. And old Sam Hadley wisely said, listen, son, I know fathers. And if your father's anything like most fathers I know, he'll forgive you and he'll welcome you back with open arms. Oh, no, sir. No, sir, he won't. Well, eventually Hadley managed to get his father's address out of him. He couldn't phone him in those days, so he wired him a telegram explain that he had his young boy here in his mission he'd found him he was in a right state he was all messed up but would the father welcome the boy home he waited all day and the seven o'clock service the mission service started that night and just as it was about to commence a telegraph boy arrived he rushed down the aisle crying out mr hadley mr hadley message for mr hadley and there was a telegram and hadley quickly opened it it was the father's reply it had just four words in it and he passed it to the young boy. Just four words. And they're the four words of God's gracious invitation to every one of us who's never had a vision of God or who's lost our vision of God and forgotten the plot. Those four words simply said this. Come home, your father. And the cross of Christ pleads with me. Come home. Your father, prodigal, whoever you may be. Come home. Your father, whose name is excellent in all the earth. He waits to be gracious to you and to me. For he has paid the cost in Christ his son to bring rebels and sinners home to share his glory. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That name of goodness, of grace, of mercy and compassion, of new start, forgiveness, and glory restored. Thank you, Lord, that your word puts us in our place tells us that we're not gods, but we're made to be like you and to come and share your glory, a glory that you've bought back in Christ. Oh, Lord, restore our vision of you. And may some of us for the first time tonight and all of us, Lord, however long we've walked with you, Come home afresh and anew to you. And ask that by your spirit, you would transform us, the dust of the earth, into princes with you, our God. Thank you that that image that you've made us in, though ruined and defaced by sin, is being renewed through Christ the image bearer himself. We bow before you. Son of God, thank you. Thank you that you are determined to bring many sons and daughters with you to glory. Thank you that you're not ashamed to call us your brothers and sisters. Make us worthy of the name we bear, reflect your glory, not in spite of us, but through us. Here is our Father and our God, Lord God Almighty, whose name is excellent in all the earth.